energy permitting reform was a key selling point to some lawmakers as they considered whether or not to raise the debt ceiling. But when President Biden signs the bill, it is expected to help speed up permitting for infrastructure and make it easier to build both fossil fuel and clean energy projects. Joining us more to, uh, to, joining us to talk more about that impact, Halima Croft is RBC Capital Markets, Global Head of Commodity Strategy and a CNBC contributor. We'll bring, get back to her in just a moment. Let me just observe, uh, this was one of the things that people thought, okay, if we can actually get bipartisan permitting reform out of this, right. hey, maybe then we got something significant to happen. Is it going to be significant enough to overcome what right now is just an incredibly laborious process? It, for renewable, uh, that's how you got, that's how you kind of got the, uh, the left in, all in, right. Right. finally, because the permitting involves, you know, you got to get permits for, for those projects as, as well as... Right, uh, they say as, you can do renewable. What do we call it, legacy energy? I don't know what we have. Yeah. I think Halima, Halima's yeah, back. Let's ask Halima. What do you think, Halima? It's good to see you this morning. How significant will this be for old energy and new? Well, I mean, this is a key ask of Joe Manchin from President Biden as part of getting the debt ceiling deal done was Mountain Valley Pipeline. That was something that has now been deemed in the national interest to be completed in a timely manner. And so this is the big issue that, you know, U.S. oil companies have said to the Biden administration is you want more oil from us? We want from you help on permitting. So I do think this is, can be seen at least as a down payment on the Biden administration's pledge to help U.S. oil and gas companies get more out of the ground and onto the water. But no sooner had we heard about that as a breakthrough when you realized, well, first of all, he had to negotiate to get that specific pipeline directly in the bill, which doesn't exactly sound like a win for everybody. And his neighbor, Senator Tim Kaine, is threatening to strip that pipeline amendment from the bill. I mean, this just shows the challenge that President Biden faces with the whole energy program with Democrats, you know, in Congress. I mean, you have a number of progressives that would like to keep all fossil fuels in the ground. But the Biden administration has taken more recently a more pragmatic approach, wanting more U.S. oil and gas to help deal with inflation issues in the United States. So, again, President Biden is trying to walk a middle path, but certainly there are challenges with the Democrats on this issue. Right. Obviously, it didn't work. I mean, he, the, the pipeline remains in. Are there broader kind of, um, what do we call them, uh, ways in which the bill, Halima, will really help fossil fuel and new energy projects get done? I mean, truly, seriously, streamline the process. What's in the bill? What changes from here? I mean, again, the most important thing is clearly going to be on the pipeline process. I mean, I'm actually sitting in Vienna right now, and for energy prices right now, you're flashing them on the screen. I mean, I think the big issue we want to talk about quickly before this segment is over is we have an OPEC meeting happening this weekend, and certainly President Biden has been very focused on diplomacy to the big oil-producing states in OPEC to try to have help in terms of OPEC production policy. So one of the issues I think we should think about, like, right now in the next couple of days is in terms of energy prices is really what happens this weekend with this all-important OPEC meeting. Yeah, no, I, I mean, obviously, I, I totally agree. <laughs> but there are, there's regions of the country, you know, northeast, whatever, yes. where, you know, they're paying higher prices because they don't have the infrastructure, and that's more of... Um, yeah you know, some obstructionism as opposed to just the process piece yeah. of this. So you're in Vienna. I, I guess they tried to block some journalists from attending. Uh, they deny there's a rift. Our analyst yesterday said there's no rift between Saudi and Russia. No rift sounds bullish, I guess. What do you think? I mean, the big question is, you know, what is going to happen tomorrow and on Sunday with the OPEC meeting? Now, Russia has said that they would do significant production cuts. If you look at the secondary source data, they are not, you know, fulfilling the production cuts that they said they would do. Saudi Arabia and Iraq have done the bulk of the heavy lifting when it comes to the production cuts that have been announced since October. The question is, does OPEC believe that they have to do more? Where you look at where Brent prices are, the question is, are we potentially looking at another production cut coming out of this meeting? One thing that I say is important when you talk about the White House is, in October, the response from the White House was obviously very angry about the OPEC production cuts, what we are hearing right now is if OPEC were to proceed, you know, with a modest production cut, you would not get the same type of blowback from the Biden administration. I think they are much more cognizant of the fiscal pressures that these oil producing countries are facing. And so while they would not be thrilled with a production cut, we're not going to potentially see the same type of angry response that we saw in October yeah. to a production cut this time. Yeah, I think uh, Tom McClellan is out there calling for oil to bottom. We heard Jeff Curry bullish yesterday, thinks the liquidation is, is nearing an end. And if so, maybe inflation would bottom too, which would not be so good.